Okay, so hello everyone. Thanks for coming for the last talk of the day and thanks for being brave enough to stay here <coughs> until the evening. My name is Rita Ranek and I work for Red Hat. Specifically, I work as a QE for GDG, which is Jitable's data grid platform, which is a program that built on top of the InfiniSpan project. And uh, during this presentation, I will like to give you a really, a really brief introduction into some uh, machine learning, neural networks, and stuff like this. But at uh, this, uh, uh, I will mention quite a lot of stuff which may seem uh, to be a little bit uh, hard, uh, at least at the first sight. So before we get into it, let's uh, start with some motivation why we actually want to do that. What you can see here is a plot which shows uh, uh, how the amount of data produced on the internet grows over time. So it's probably not surprising that the amount of data grows exponentially. What is more uh, interesting is uh, uh, this uh, two color uh, areas. This one which grows uh, roughly linearly uh, is estimate how uh, many of data is structured. But, uh, and this exponential contribution is uh, data which is not structured or semi-structured. So could you give me some examples uh, or how do you understand uh, non-structured data? Anybody? So, go ahead. For example, when uh, someone uh, chats with someone another? Yeah, sure. It can be text and something other. It's written here. <laughs> okay, so basically, uh, it's uh, most of the stuff you produce on the internet. If you upload something on Facebook, Twitter, uh, write some blog post, it's <laughs> some text, it can contain numbers, it can also contain images, and of course, for example, image itself, uh, it's uh, basically unstructured data because you don't know what's on the, what's in it. Uh, unless the user uh, describe it, tag it, and some, something like this. The same is, applies for video and so on. So, anybody in the room who stores uh, uh, terabytes or petabytes of data just for fun, raise your hand. Oh, nobody. So, uh, obviously, uh, probably nobody would like to store a huge amount of data without knowing what's uh, in this data, right? So. To get something useful from a uh, large amount of data you store for your application, uh, which you run for users, or it can be just that you say, for example, what users does on your web page and so on, you need uh, to process this data to get some useful information from it. So uh, we can uh, start uh, this whole area is usually called machine learning, or it's one of the uh, approaches how to do that. And it's really was a huge topic, which covers uh, start with uh, some uh, trivial techniques like parsing the text uh, or doing some averaging histograms and so on. Uh, but or you can use some, uh, for example, linear regression and uh, things like that. But uh, there are <coughs> classes of problems where these simple models will completely fail. Uh, and uh, in the rest of the talk, I'd like to uh, focus on this hard part, uh, which, for example, can be, uh, as I mentioned, image as an unstructured data, and you want to recognize what's in the image. This is a typical example where you, if you are, want to have some uh, good success rate, you typically have to apply some more complicated models. So <coughs> this is what I will uh, <coughs> describe in the rest of the talk. So how to address these uh, harder problems? You probably heard about the deep learning. Uh, it's a buzzword, but actually this is not uh, uh, something completely new. It's basically uh, applying deep neural networks uh, on these problems. What is deep neural network? It's uh, it's sketched here. It's uh, the simple, the simplest possible uh, deep neural network. Uh, typical definition of deep neural network is neural network which, which has two or more hidden layers. So here is input where, for example, you send 
your image. These are hidden layers, and here is the output, what is typically, for example, some classifier, which I will tell you that on this picture is a dog, on this picture is a cat, and something like this. So this is a non-linear model, which is able to solve uh, this problem. Uh, uh, another, uh, so this is one part of the problem. The second part of the problem is that uh, in a recent years there is more and more pressure from <coughs> users to process data almost in real time. Uh, nobody wants to wait for the feedback. If you want to upload something somewhere, you want to get immediate feedback, for example, similar post and things like this, and you want to this immediately. And as this is happening in a really large amount of data, this uh, is usually not called big data, but it uh, starts to be called fast data. So basically the problem is that you have really huge amount of data and you need to process uh, uh, almost in real time uh, as much uh, fast as possible. There are again some techniques how to do that. Uh, for example, you switch to end streaming, this is pretty obvious. Uh, you can keep the data in memory as much as possible. Uh, during uh, uh, When you do some computation like uh, regression model or averaging and so on, uh, you probably heard about Apache Spark, right? This is a typical example uh, which does that. It uh, compared to a series of Hadoop uh, MapReduce job on top of HDFS. Apache Spark can give you uh, pretty nice speed up. Not only the main thing is that it tries to keep it async in memory, but there is lots of more optimization it does. Uh, and another uh, hint how to uh, be fast is not to keep uh, the data in memory when you do some computation, but as you typically uh, do something with the results, so you should keep the data in memory whole your application stack. Uh, and uh, I won't go into the details. I spoke about this topic here a uh, year ago, so if you want uh, to uh, learn something uh, more about this, you can check my talk from the last year. I gave there also there some brief introduction into Apache Spark, so if you haven't heard about Apache Spark yet, it can also give you some introduction. So basically, let me do a really short summary what we have now. Actually, we have a problem, because we have uh, data which can be pretty complex which required some complex processing to sort out. And at the same time, we want to do that uh, as fast as possible in ideal case in real time. So it uh, might sound a uh, little bit maybe impossible or at least hard to do. So in the uh, rest of the talk, I will try to uh, show you that uh, it's not impossible and actually if you choose the right tools, it can be actually quite easy. Uh, there are many tools which you can use. I choose a couple of uh, them which I like, so it's my personal choice. Uh, it can be done very likely with other tools, so uh, uh, if you uh, have a question why you choose uh, some of these tools, I will show you later on the answers because I use them, I like them, and typically, for example, I will give you a short introduction into <laughs> TensorFlow, so question why I choose that, because in the past I worked with that a little bit, so I like that, and uh, there can be some discussion what's sort of better and what's now, but it's probably not important here. So first uh, uh, <clears throat> a tool I like to introduce you is TensorFlow. It's a, to, uh, toolkit for building deep neural networks and other computational uh, graphs. The second one is InfiniSpan. Uh, here is obvious why I choose it because I work on it. Uh, and uh, the last one to have complete pictures because these kind of data like pictures, videos and so on are usually not possible to keep everything in memory all the time. So typically you would probably need some data layer 
where you upload the data from InfiniSpan so I choose SAP, which is, uh, in my opinion, quite interesting technology. Here can be HDFS or whatever you want. Uh, there are typically standard solutions. So uh, one thing I choose SAP is because I found it really interesting compared to, for example, uh, OpenStack Swift or S3. And the second one is that if you do some search uh, in the internet how to use, for example, Apache Spark with SAP, uh, you typically don't found, uh, find any good answer for that. So I, I try to show you that with InfiniSpan it's easy to use also SAP. <coughs> so uh, now I will uh, give, uh, I'll try to give you quick introduction into each of these three projects and in the end I will show you how to how it can work together. So let's get started with TensorFlow. As I said, uh, it's a tool for building uh, primary uh, focus on building a deep neural network. There are many such frameworks. Maybe if you are a little bit interested in neural networks, you probably already heard about Kafka, Theano, CNTK, Deep Learning 4J, or TensorFlow. And, uh, uh, if you are interested in some more complete list with some uh, short overview of what each framework uh, uh, can do, here is a quite nice short summary on this Wikipedia page. And if you check there, you can uh, actually see that uh, the market here is quite competitive and uh, many frameworks can uh, cover basically uh, all everything what other framework does. So it's uh, uh, I'm not saying that TensorFlow is the best because I never do any research about that, but I like it. Uh, it's a, a library done by Google Brains team. If you are interested in this, I would recommend you to read this white paper. Uh, it uh, can give you more in-depth uh, introduction uh, how it works, about its architecture and so on. Uh, it's actually second generation of uh, Google machine learning system. The first one was called Disbelief, and it was open sourced about uh, one year ago. Obviously, it's used by Google for, for example, speech recognition, photos processing, and uh, many other projects. And uh, uh, it's, of course, used by many other projects uh, outside uh, Google. Uh, I would like to hear mention the only one. It's Mozilla Deep Speech Project, and I'm mentioning it because uh, here uh, on DevCons it is another talk about this project on Sunday by Tillman Camp. So if you are interested in uh, machine learning, I, I guess this this one could be uh, also interesting interesting uh, <coughs> talk for you. So let's get get a quick overview or get some basis of TensorFlow. Uh, TensorFlow represents uh, uh, or provides you some pieces from which you can build your, for example, neural network. Uh, and it's uh, stored in a graph, computational graph. There's a trivial sketch here. Uh, the <coughs> nodes represent represent mathematical operation like matrix multiplication, add, applying, for example, predefined. There are some predefined functions like, like row functions which you can apply on top of the matrix. And the edges are inputs to, to the operations. Well, so you built this from the pieces TensorFlow provides for you. You built this graph, so typically you built some neural network, and then you will run it in some session. So you will bring, create your model and then push it into some session and run it. So session is basically a client uh, uh, representation of a particular TensorFlow runtime. There are two kinds of variables besides ordinary variables I'd like to mention. First one is what is called variable in TensorFlow, and it's variable which has predefined size and type. <coughs> and the sec second one is placeholder, <coughs> which is not known, uh, or its size, it's not known during uh, the 
or and value of uh, the most important thing. The value is not known during the, uh, the time when you create the graph and typically serves as an input uh, to, to, to this graph. So typically, for example, if you process the image, the image will uh, be placeholder and when you run uh, this uh, graph, it will be input to this graph. And last thing I will use uh, or mention later on is checkpoint. It's typically a file where you can store uh, the variables and if you want, you can store the whole uh, uh, output of or whole state of your graph. So what is typically usage is that you train your neural network, store it into some checkpoint, push checkpoint somewhere, then load pre-train neural network and then only apply it to some input data which is coming <coughs> to the system. Uh, this is uh, the, this this graph uh, represented in uh, Python, the main uh, API in terms of flow is provided uh, only in Python. Uh, as you probably know, the data scientists like Python quite a lot, so this is probably the reason behind that. Uh, and I will talk about uh, how to uh, deal with that in different languages a little bit later. But uh, now, uh, here, if you know a little bit of Python, I think it's readable also if you uh, never saw Python before. Here we defined two variables, which are two matrices and one placeholder, and then we multiply this W and X, this is here, and add B, and apply a root function on, on top of that, and then proceed with some other operation. So, as I said, this uh, could be very, very simple model, and then, as I mentioned, we create a session and run this model in the session. So here I load some input, it can be whatever I want to process, and then I put it in a dictionary. So I have here a placeholder called x, so I will here provide that x is this input, and I will run the session. <coughs> and basically that's all. So hopefully, is, is that anything unclear uh, about this? Because this is basically how it works, and I, I hope it's uh, not not difficult. So, as I said, TensorFlow provides you building blocks. It also provides uh, some cool functions, uh, like so. Uh, you you can it provides some typical used uh, uh, cost functions for neural networks, optimizers uh, like gradient descent optimizers, and so on. And th these all are just building blocks and from this you can build whatever uh, net neural network or any other computational graph you want. So basically it's up to uh, how you do that. So hopefully uh, this is clear. So may I have a yeah. question yeah. to the previous uh, image? <coughs> well, uh, uh, my question is how is this related to the, to the neural network itself? Uh, is Can I um, can this I say that the nodes from the hidden layer are like the... Yeah, this is actually looks like this. Yes. Yeah. So, so the B, W, X is like the input? Is like the... Typically X only is input and uh, this is um, uh, variables, this is bias yes. and th this is weights. Yes. Which you tune <coughs> when you train the neural network. So basically you tune, this is parameters and you tune it during the training. So, uh -huh, okay. yeah, okay. clear? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I would quickly mention a couple other features which, which I found really cool uh, in terms of flow. The first one is that you can st store it in a protobuf format. Uh, I'm not sure if you ever heard about protobuf. It's a format from Google which can be read in or Google provides uh, uh, finding for many languages, so you can reload it uh, in other languages. Uh, another nice thing is uh, that it uh, you don't have to care about local details. You write your model and then you can run it on a CPU, on your local host, uh, train it, play with your model, and when you are satisfied, you can push it 
into dedicated cluster when it, you can run it on a lot of GPUs and stuff like that. It also supports CUDA. Uh, and so you don't have to deal with uh, this quite uh, low level details. And uh, another important thing is that it support clustering. It uses gRPC <coughs> on the root again, you just above, and it's able to uh, distribute the load uh, over the cluster. This is a trivial example of how it works. So again, it's quite easy, and it uh, takes a lot of hard <laughs> work, which you have to program yourself. Uh, so uh, it's done in the framework. So you can very easily distribute the load uh, over your cluster and uh, run it in distributed fashion. So, now, uh, uh, later on, I will run it in, from Java. So, how to do that? For example, you are fine to build your model in Python, but you don't want to write, run in production in Python. So, uh, uh, as I said, the main API is in Python, and uh, it provides only very limited API for C++. There, there are two issues to provide the API in Java, but unfortunately these two are still not done. But fortunately, we can uh, reuse C++ API via GNI, and don't worry, you don't have to do this, this yourself. There are a couple of libraries <coughs> which are already implemented, and one I use, and it works really nice, is uh, Java CPP presets. Uh, so, using this library, uh, it looks in Java something like this. You build your model in Python, store it uh, in, into a protobuf file, and then in Java, just define new graph. Here you read the protobuf file, create new session, uh, and load, load the graph into the session. Then you define a new tensor. It's basically ma matrix. Uh, if you never heard tensor before, uh, Matrix is oh, one special case of tensor. So uh, it's, uh, here it's called tensor. And could load some input data into it. And here you run the session. And it's similar to Python, but as it's usual in Java, it's more uh, rather, rather, rather line. But basically, it again, just provides uh, the input and it says here, yeah, I'm not consistent here, uh, what in the previous slide was X, here's images. So I had in my model uh, <coughs> a placeholder which is called images, and here I pro provide new array of tensors and with only one item, and it's this input. So hopefully, again, it's readable. And the nice thing, if, even if you don't want to read this, <coughs> The take takeoff from this is that to load the model uh, in Java, it's just a few lines of code. It's not not something very difficult. So let's move to InfiniSpan. Anybody in the room who never heard about InfiniSpan? Oh, still some. I expected that everybody heard about this nice piece of software, but if not, uh, it's a data grid platform written in Java, so it's basically in-memory data grid which tries to store everything in memory, and uh, uh, it's a key value store uh, which uh, is highly available, there is no single point of failure, uh, it's elastic, uh, it also, if you provide some schema, it, uh, you can do some searches, it's transactional, and it has really lots of cool features. I'm not able to go through it uh, here. There was a uh, good talk about InfiniSpan this morning by Sebastian, and if you miss it, I will refer you to infinispan.org. Uh, but uh, basically, uh, to understand what will follow, you don't have to understand some cool features of InfiniSpan, just keep in mind that it's something which can run in a cluster and uh, keeps all the data in memory. So it tries to provide some layer which is really fast and 
where you can store your data. The only thing I will mention uh, from enforcement features is something what is uh, called cache store abstraction, and it basically uh, typical <coughs> use case you don't want to keep all your data in a memory, you want to offload some data into some permanent storage, or even if you can keep everything in memory, you want to have some backup if something happened. So uh, this is a way how you can load uh, the data from InfiniSpan to some <coughs> permanent storage, and again then load the data from permanent storage to back and forth. It, it works both ways. And uh, there are various implementation of cache stores. You can store the data into databases, various like providers like OpenShift uh, Swift or, or sorry, OpenStack Swift uh, or Amazon S3, uh, LevelDB, Cassandra, and also SAP. Uh, what I forgot to mention here is this configuration piece and this is how you configure the cache to keep only some limited number of items so here I define that I want to do eviction of items and I want to keep only five items and I can choose strategy which will be used this uh, LRU is uh, least recently used strategy so it means that uh, when I have five items in a cache and I will add Six, uh, one item will be uh, removed from InfiniSpan to permanent storage and it will be the item which was uh, least accessed. So, who is, uh, uh, which uh, is kept in memory uh, the uh, longest amount of time untouched. Is there more fancy cache replacement policies as well than like ancient LRU? Yeah. In particular, if you have larger cache sizes, that makes sense, like multi-queue eviction policies or whatever. It's, uh, there are, I, don't, I think, three policies implemented by uh, default, and I, if I'm not mistaken, I, I will have to check. I think you can define your own, but I'm okay. not completely sure about this. So, But at least you can choose more strategies, <coughs> more pre predefined strategies. Mm -hmm. So uh, now a few words about SAP. It's a uh, distributed <coughs> object storage. Uh, the really nice uh, uh, thing about it is that it provides uh, various <coughs> access to the data layer. You can access it, access it as object storage, block device, and also uh, as a regular Pool 6 file system. And all this uh, can be applied to one cluster, so you don't have to uh, <coughs> run dedicated cluster for object storage and uh, dedicated one for if you want to run uh, some shared uh, uh, file system. Everything can run on top of single set cluster. Again, similar as InfiniSpan, it's uh, highly available without no single point of failure. And uh, they said that uh, it can scale to exabyte level. I personally never tried, so I don't know. You can try it at home if you like. Uh, I would believe that if they uh, stay this. And of course, it's open source. Here's a high level architecture overview. There are three ways how you can access it. And actually, there's fourth one, and it's what is provided by. So the, in the bottom here is what they call RADOS, and it's basically the uh, uh, distributed <coughs> object storage itself. And the first way how you can access it is libRADOS, and uh, uh, it's a library which you can bind to your application and talk from your application to the uh, RADOS uh, distributed object store. And uh, uh, a few months ago, I implemented cache store for InfiniSpan, which uh, can store data into the uh, set and it's use this libradus. So hopefully, uh, it's uh, it, it's far. I never done uh, so far any performance test, but it should be faster than this two typical ways which you can use because it goes directly through 
Liprados and JNI calls. And how to integrate it with InfiniSpan? It's again pretty easy. You just add this, for example, to InfiniSpan server, this piece of code where you just uh, define the IP address of the cluster and your credentials to let you in, and that's all. So, again, the integration is pretty easy. So, before we go to the demo, so uh, I try to show you that uh, writing the model in uh, TensorFlow is up to you. How to do that? Just uh, save it into protobuf file, <coughs> loading into uh, Java in some uh, uh, InfiniSpan client is pretty easy. It's a couple of <coughs> lines of code and integration of InfiniSpan with set is about, again, a few lines of code of configuration uh, as everything is done for you. So now to the demo where I try to put everything together. Uh, I try to keep it as simple as possible. So I use the uh, neural network hell work example and it's a I MNIST mean, data sample. If you never heard about this before, it's basically a set of handwritten digits and the goal is to recognize oh, which digit is written on the picture. And uh, the second reason why I choose it is because uh, uh, TensorFlow uh, guys uh, did quite a nice job and it's the uh, MNIST tutorial uh, or tutorials which use MNIST data samples on TensorFlow. Uh, documentation pages. There are very little <coughs> tutorial for beginners and also a slightly <coughs> faster tutorial for experts. Uh, basically I copy paste the code from there so that if you uh, go f uh, through the code of the demo later on uh, there, is, uh, there are no comments because uh, it's really detailed commented here so uh, you can go there and read step by step what, what it does. And even if you don't want to go through the, my demo, I, I would uh, recommend you to check uh, these pages because it's a really nice interaction. So here is uh, uh, some high-level architecture of this demo. I have some huge client in C++ which loads the images from training set or, or sorry, for, from test set. Uh, if I click on someone, uh, it will send it to InfiniSpan, so it just can represent some IoT device or a skewed uh, application uh, can be ported to mobile phones, it can be also <coughs> mobile phone. Uh, uh, the call here, uh, there are various ways how to push it into InfiniSpan. In this demo I use REST API. When it arrives to InfiniSpan, uh, it sends to TensorFlow client it's basically a TensorFlow uh, or application which run my model, uh, my TensorFlow model, and is uh, uh, and which use InfiniSpan listener. So immediately once it connects to InfiniSpan, and immediately once InfiniSpan get uh, any data, <coughs> it will send it to TensorFlow. Uh, once the image is classified, the result with with the number. It found it's on the picture, it's sent back to the InfiniSpan, and again from InfiniSpan it's sent to Node.js server, and uh, Node.js will send it to the browser. So, and uh, behind the scenes, InfiniSpan is set up with some eviction, so uh, the data in a cache are moved <coughs> from InfiniSpan to the set. So, I will show you this part and this part. All the interesting stuff is happening here, but there's no, no, nothing much what I can show you. So uh, hopefully, uh, uh, it, it, the, actually, there's no, not much to show, but uh, basically the output is that it should work together. As you can see, I intentionally choose uh, different things like C++, JavaScript, and so on. As you can see, here's that there are about five different languages and uh, uh, your application can be simpler but what I like to show that it's not big demo and uh, you can still integrate uh, <coughs> several couple uh, or several languages together quite, quite easily and it's not a big pain. So, how much time do I have? 
five minutes, so... Mm, so... I have infinite span server running. Here is uh, my application which runs TensorFlow with infinite span client. Here is <coughs> Node.js server running. <coughs> and I connect to infinite span. Yeah, I also have VM which runs uh, SAP. So here I can. Show the pools which are running there. Here you can see is a pool which will store uh, the data from InfiniSpan. It should be empty now, so yeah, there's nothing here. And so here I have. Uh, my cute uh, application which load uh, test uh, data from MNIST uh, sample so as you can see as I said it's hand written digits when I click on some number it will send it to infinite span with ID of the image which is some ID a number of uh, in, in an array and as I showed you in slide before it will get processed and hopefully will appear here so let's try. Wow, and it looks like that it works. So uh, I can click some more. Um, so <laughs> now there sh still shouldn't be anything here in set because uh, I should keep five items in infinite span. But when I click somewhere here. So now there should be two items stored in a set because they get evicted from infinite span. And yeah, they are there. And it's ID uh, 102 and 147. So these are the last two get evicted. So uh, basically, as I said, there is not much to show here because all the interesting stuff is happening here under the hood, but the output is that, that it works and it works in real, real time. And all, all the pieces you have here, you can scale in a cluster, and uh, so you should be able to scale, uh, scale it as you need. And if you, uh, I'm, I don't have much time, so I actually, I have one more minute. So I won't go into the source code, but it's not very long. You can go through it, download from my GitHub, and uh, you can see that uh, to put everything together is really a few, a few couple of lines of code. And it's actually pretty, pretty easy because all hard uh, stuff is done for you. So let's go to the summary. If you uh, forget everything from this talk, I would like to remember three points that one first one is that building a pipeline for processing complex data in real time or almost real time can be actually quite easy if you uh, use the right tools. I think that uh, definitely one of these tools is TensorFlow, which is a really powerful machine learning framework. And the last one is uh, that Infinite span is a real middleware because all the pieces in this demo was glued together by infinite span. So that is not only just some stupid cache, but it's really a major piece of hardware which you can use as a backbone for your application stack. So questions. Why did it not behave like LRU, but uh, most recently used? Most? Yeah, basically it put the second last and the second entry you hit No, it was the least recently stone. used. I mean the last two. <coughs> right. Yeah. The most yeah, recently yeah. used was on top. It has the first no. five in the cache. Yeah. So the topmost two have to be evicted to get... No, no, no. It's our way around. So, mm -hmm. 
here, here is seven, and if I click something, it will appear under block. So when I click here, so it, it will appear on the top. So, uh, so, so these that. two were evicted, and it's correct. Okay. So there are no other questions. So thank. Oh, how did you train your model? I didn't get that part. Yeah. I didn't mention it here. Um, as I said, uh, it's uh, basically, I wanted to keep it simple, so I just use uh, the example from TensorFlow. Oh. So basically, I run, and it's really stupid, uh, neural networks, there is no regularization dropout and so on, so I'm quite surprised that it correctly identified all uh, the pictures, and it was just a lot because success rate was only about 90%, and so basically, I. Uh, use one provided by TensorFlow examples, train it, train it with the uh, MNIST uh, uh, train set, and then use a uh, uh, test sample. And uh, basically, this is a typical approach with which you probably use that you will train your model in your internal cluster and then push into production <coughs> some train or train neural network, unless you want to use some. Uh, approach like stochastic gradient descent that, that your network gets trained as user use it. But uh, if I say that this is quite common uh, use case that you will train it uh, <coughs> some data and then push into production already trained neural network. Yeah. So it can only analyze some uh, only specific type of patterns, uh, handwriting patterns. <laughs> This this example yes. take only uh, yeah uh, on, only this concrete data, data sample. If you want to apply uh, on some random data, like if I take my mobile phone and write some digit here and uh, check it, uh, it would require quite a lot of uh, stuff because you have to center the image and do a lot of uh, stuff like this. So it, it would be much more complicated than than this simple uh, demo. So if it is a really long line, it will slice each and every alphabet and try to analyze it, right? Alphabet or, um, yeah, it, it's definitely possible and uh, doable. And I think maybe, you, if not uh, in a uh, terms of flow directly, I think that on Udacity is some online uh, cook course which you can take by the tenors of four guys and there is I guess some example when you uh, train your model for the whole al alphabet. And it's not just images, right? You can you, you can give it text to, to, to find patterns in it. You know, right. I mean. Yeah, it's not not that simple like recognize uh, the numbers. If you would like to take some text and split it, it, it would be again uh, one level more complicated than this. 